Nice camera. <laughs> yeah. I like Nikon's. So I'm going to talk about character and world building. Uh, Kaviria to Gone with the Wind, and uh, Snow White and Seven Dwarfs to 100 Dalmatians, uh, 100, 101 Dalmatians, uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Odyssey to Arrival. Each of these films evoke a specific world of their own as a filmic, movie-going experience. Pretty pictures are nice. Hang them on a wall. Yeah, I, I use that a lot. <laughs> um, what does a production designer do? So, um, we're visual architects. As one of the first people on a show, the production designer begins by listening to the story and the director, reading between the lines to understand not just the surface of the film, but the hidden deeper meanings, intended or not, that might, be open, might open up visual possibilities or spin ideas in different directions. For some time, the job is more story and character related than art or looks related, although they're, they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, we do research to find the small, unusual, and specific elements to the world that can help make it unique and work to edit those elements into what best supports and what least distracts from the story being told. Um, visual story development. This is an important one for me, and I am going to read it because I spent a lot of time writing it and I want to get it right. Artwork for animation films during pre-production is created not just to explain what will be, but what could be, to excite the imagination and spur other sometimes better ideas in the mind of the director, the entire crew, by exploring as wide as you can as many of the visual possibilities of the world being created entirely from scratch. Artwork meant only to be serviceable to the production is a disservice to the film. The practical realities of production, story adjustments, design changes, technical difficulty, acts of God, are so difficult, expensive, and time consuming that having inspirational artwork around helps remind everyone of what excited us about the ideas in the first place. It's also a practical tool for the same reason. When production problems arise, this artwork can help us remember what is and what isn't important by offering sometimes simple solutions to very vexing problems. It's easy to get lost in the weeds, really, you know, in the middle of production. What is the most important aspect in the art direction of a movie? The story. <laughs> it's true, the story. It's like figuring out what the who, the who, what, when, where, and why is this in the movie? What's the history of it? What, what, what is that? In me? What, why is this what it is when I'm looking at it? So that, that. And then the second thing that's the hardest is making sure that what we're doing is right, but also that it is uh, it feels uh, organic to the story, that it's not trying to steal attention. It's not saying, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me. I'm important, you know? When I should be paying attention to these two characters talking in the foreground or crying or hugging or something like that, you know? So, so. This is a design board from Up. You can look at it yourself to see as we're starting to think things through. Defining and clarifying this stuff is, it takes a lot of time, a lot of discussion, Sometimes a lot of artwork, sometimes we pin words up, you know, start looking at shapes and, and, and broad visual themes. How does it relate to the film? What path can be followed to become a production designer? Oh boy, you can go, there's so many choices these days. It's really good. I, I think, uh, well, for film production design, I think um, they can study uh, costume, theater design, lighting, you know, I think you can study architecture. Mm -hmm. um, Draw, learn how to draw. I think drawing is very important, even still very much today. I think it's not about drawing, it's not about the technical facility, although it is, you know, it's, it's learning how to draw well. It's about learning how to see. Mm -hmm. It's about looking at something and drawing it, not, not on a computer, freehand with a pen on paper. Okay. It's, a little, it's like paying attention to something and drawing it. And, and there's an osmosis that happens between your eye and an object and your hand and your brain and then onto paper that helps you remember those specific small, oh, I, I'm looking at that lamp and I see a fingerprint on it. That's weird, okay. Well, mm -hmm. Someone must have been trying to, and you know, suddenly a story comes out of it. Someone's trying to put the bulb in and they're holding it too tight so they're 
finger burns through. I don't know, you know, <laughs> so you can be, or dented or broken or something. You know, they're, they're, watching, suddenly it's a story there. And watching films. And well, sure, watching films too, but looking at things in real life, I think is the best way. You know, and and if you learn how to draw, the computer is very cool and very fast, but it's not faster than drawing. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it's also just a, it's a good mental exercise to really pick up and notice details. You, know, you that and honestly, in a way, you could I have yet to see anyone be able to do straight onto the computer, being able to draw it and see it and like. I wonder why. I wonder why there's drips are on this metal over here. You can see it over there. You know, um, what what is that about? I'll put that in my drawing. You know, so yeah, I think it's important. Yeah. Uh, another film that I like because of the visual touchstones that again the audience gets used to and they get to also modulate them over time is Paper Moon, 1973 film. Oops, sorry. Let me back up. By Peter Bogdanovich and it's designed by Polly Platt. It's about a grifter in the Great Depression who is outsmarted by a child who turns out to be a better a grifting than he is. Uh, uh, they strike up a business relationship that eventually leads to a friendship. So if you haven't seen this film, highly recommend it. Please do, you know. Uh, to track their success and setbacks, the film design utilizes a series of hotel rooms through the, throughout the film. The designs of the hotel room by production designer Polly Platt and how they're presented really make the characters' relationships clear. Um, by going back to the hotel room, it gives the audience some familiarity and they become used to, oh, we're going to another hotel or a hotel room. Um, they don't have to think about it anymore in a way and really they get their time to focus on the characters and the dialogue and the scene that needs to be played. But it's also kind of underscoring their situation. So with this film, we go through a series of hotel rooms. We have the first one, which is one room and one bed. He sleeps on the floor. The next time we see them together, it's one room with two beds. The next time it's one room, two beds, and they actually have a bathroom, which is on the right here. The next time it's two rooms connected by one bathroom. And then we see them, they all have individual rooms. So this is tracking their monetary success and their success of their relationship. And the very last time, last time we see them in a hotel room, They've had a big setback. This is towards the end of the film. And they're back in one room. It does have two beds, but we only see the entire scene played out in the mirror. So it's kind of looking at it in reverse. Uh, so I, I, I love this kind of uh, design thinking. Again, you know, the, the idea of the, how the beds are arranged and the images and all on the wall, they can all help contribute to the storytelling as well. But the idea of the hotel room is really what's kind of tying all of this together. Which film inspired you the most? Well, I'll tell you, the, the first film that, you know, before I got interested in production design, I was mostly interested in animation. I was interested in film too. Mm -hmm. I loved everything. But animation was the thing that I wanted to do, you know? And it was, uh, when I was 10 years old, my sister took me to see Cin Walt Disney Cinderella. And that film got me. It got me. You know, the scene where uh, they leave her, they tear her clothes off, and she runs through the house, and she's crying, and the fairy godmother shows up. I'm just like, ah. <laughs> you know? And, but then I was happy at the end, and suspenseful with the mice and the key up the stairs. It's got everything you want in a movie, you know? And it's 79 minutes long, and it's everything. Great songs, great emotion, great characters, drama, you know, very tight story. Uh, it got me, and, and that was the day, the next day I went to the library and I wanted to know everything about animation, you know, which then led me to more films, which led me to animating and then the business and then production design. So, you know, uh, production design wise, if there was a film that really stuck in my head as a kid, it would probably be Citizen Kane, you know, <laughs> just like, like what, 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 why is this what it is? I don't understand this, you know, so I wanted to figure it out. So. Uh, another film, more recent film, which is, I, I, I like a lot, uh, in particular because of the design work, is The King's Speech. It's uh, from 2010, to directed by Tom Hooper. It concerns England's King, King George's stuttering condition and his attempts to overcome it as, as he becomes the King of England when his brother abdicates the throne. So what is the film about, really? It's about vocal constriction. So the film is shot and designed, uh, designed to be shot in very, very tight quarters and close-ups, and a lot of the sets kind of indicate constriction and narrow spaces 
from, you know, even fog can kind of make you claustrophobic. Uh, the street kind of very narrow. Um, and of course the, the, the um, elevator with the, the king and the you know, queen in it, very tight. And you get to his vocal coach played by Jeffrey Rush and they use slightly wider lenses or very much wider lenses and open spaces and objects in the room are evenly spaced. You still can't see out the windows, they're still fogged over. Um, the wallpaper on the back wall is peeling off. You know, I, I, I think that that was to, to show that it's not a physical problem, it's a mental problem that he's having. And they want to peel, the doctor wants to peel back the layers to figure out why is he stuttering. I always thought that nice, one of the nice touches is the first time we cut into the room at this angle, which is on the upper left, is that fireplace in the back, which looks like a giant throat, you know? Again, these are more scenes of the king, very tight spaces and constricted at the top. And then Lore is uh, his teacher, Jeffrey Rush, especially the image on the right at home. He lives in a very small apartment, but things are evenly spaced again. They're using wider lenses and it feels a lot larger than it really is. You know, there's breathing room. And one of the nice touches in the film is as the king's about to give a speech at the end of the film, is Jeffrey Rush walks over and lifts and opens the window. It's uh, one of the, I think it's the only time in the movie he does something like that. And then the king gives a speech and his family walks out and onto the balcony into the entire open air, you know? So I, I love the, the, the big picture thinking on this film, I think is terrific. What about Pete Doctor as the new chief creative officer of Pixar? I don't know yet, I don't know yet. You know, when I finished, when you're working on a film, especially at the end, especially when they take a year off of your schedule, which they did, you're so focused on that film. You're just like laser focused finishing and then it's done. And then you're like, huh? You know, and you're looking around and oh, they painted the room. Okay. There's new people. I don't, you know, it's like that. Every film is kind of like that. And um, I don't know yet. I took time off after the film. I needed to deal with some personal stuff and uh, I'm just now kind of getting back to the studio, so I don't know yet. I love Pete, I'm excited. Pete's, Pete's got a tough spot too. He's in a tough spot in that he's directing a movie. Um, he started directing the movie before he was named in his new role. So he's doing both, it's hard for him. Uh, I don't envy that. <laughs> uh, but he's also very good at it. And his new film's gonna be terrific, I, I know, I've seen it. And, uh, um, but I, I know Pete is uh, exactly the right person for that job. I think he's, I, I can't imagine anyone else doing it, or certainly not anyone else doing it better. But I don't think we know yet. I really don't. I think animation takes a long time. Um, developing new projects and getting them into production and then actually making them and then distributing them and marketing them. It can take uh, a long time. So I think it's a slow boat. I, I, I uh, certainly wish Pete well, and I'm excited to see what he does, but I, I don't think we know yet. I really don't. Uh, Incredibles 2, I talked about on Monday. Uh, this is the original Par home. It, had, it was kind of pointed down in the middle, a little bit angry, a little frustration that the family was stuck in basically a witness protection program for superheroes. Um, we did a lot of research for the new home. We went to a place called Sunnylands, which is uh, Camp David on the West Coast for uh, visiting dignitaries, kings, queens, and presidents. Actually, it's the only people who can use it. In order to go there, we had to get approved by the Secret Service. So, so we put, I found these online and we weren't able to take photographs. Huge building, big rooms, but one of the odd things was it also had lots of small rooms. The, 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 the upper middle image, this was President Reagan's bedroom. It's about 12 by 16 feet, that's it. That's it. You know, uh, the window is behind the camera, I believe, uh, and it's floor to ceiling and it faces out into a golf course. But it was not ostentatious at all. They were very, very human scale rooms. After spending all day in these giant rooms, people felt like they just needed to get away. So they would make sure to design into the home these smaller rooms. We did the same thing for the par house as well. Um, Part of it was to put that idea across. Part of it was the director had, Brad Bird had concerns about 
Is every teen had one of them gonna be in a big, big, giant room? I don't know, it's a little hard. You need some variety as well. So we did take that idea and play it out. This is the big room for the house. And this is one of the smaller rooms. It's kind of the side room where a lot of the action takes place. And we had the kitchen as well. Uh, the, the, the idea of the, the bigger picture idea of this house, though, was a home too big for the family. Yes, they're a superhero family. Yes, they're glad to have this home. But over the course of the film, they realize, you know, it's really them and their relationship that matters more than this big home. So, so uh, I thought it worked fairly well. Actually, I thought it worked very well. So, <laughs> I like the I like that house. I'm gonna live there. So, after 15 years since the first movie. How is it to return working on a sequel? Well, first of all, it was a, f a blast because Brad Bird makes it fun. He, he was the reason I, I mean, he was the reason I would have done anything. Any movie he wanted to do, I would, I would love to work on just because he's so much fun to work with. He really, you saw him talk? Did you see him talk? Yep. He's like that, really, all the time, <laughs> you know? And uh, it's exciting and it makes you work hard, you know, and makes you feel good because you know, you know it's going to be hopefully something great. You know, <laughs> doing a sequel of any kind, there there are certain things that can be a little easier, and then there are certain things that people think of uh, that, that, that it's just hard. It's actually in some ways a lot more difficult. Um, the big technical advantage we have is that the characters are designed for the most part. The family was designed for the original. We could make them look better. We could do things we couldn't do 15 years ago. But there's only one set in the film that was in the original film, that was East House. And even that was rebuilt from scratch, but and much better than, technically than it was before. Um, there was a version of the film early on where we went back to a few other sets that were from the original film, but that got scrapped. So, um, But everything else in the film is new, so we had to design everything as though it were a brand new movie. Um, what, what I wanted to do as well is expand on it, make, uh, and, and, and I didn't want, it, it wasn't necessarily that I needed it to be bigger because there's not a lot, <laughs> you can't make it much bigger than the original film. It's pretty big in terms of scope, right? Um, and going to Nomanisan Island, you know? Um, what we could do is expand the palette, the color, and some of the other, other uh, visual ideas, uh, which is what we did. So that's how we kind of advanced, you know, we weren't changing it from the 50s to the 90s. We were changing it from the 50s to the 60s. <laughs> so even though the film takes place the day after the first film, I wanted to suggest to the audience that time had passed. And also, I didn't want it to look exactly like the first film. I did want to advance it a little bit and have a little bit more opportunity for certain colors and things like that. So yeah, it was fun. It was fun to think about. So. Do you always design the whole set of the movie as you have done with the Par Home? When you have a set like their home. You do, you go into it knowing, even if you don't know the details, you go into it knowing that you're going to need to see this home from many, many angles. And so you have to design the whole thing. If we only had this room and I knew that it was you talking to me, then okay, I could design that and that, and that's all I need. I don't need, I don't need this and this. Uh, it depends, every, case, every set is different, every set is different, so. What roles transportation design, graphing design and architecture Play in The Incredibles 2? Um, out, away from the home, I'm setting the home aside. Not, not, not because they aren't integrated, but setting it aside. You know, the, the idea of screen slaver and the damage that they were doing was, let's see, we had the train, then we had, what was the second one? Uh, the helicopters, yeah. and then we had the, the boat. Bike. Yeah, we had, it was all, it was literally about transportation. I'm glad you picked up on that. Um, uh, I, I, yeah, the designs were, it was about that. The name of my first talk was Where's My Jetpack? <laughs> Remember, as a kid, when I grew up, we, we were like, oh, we're going to have flying cars by now, you know? And so that was the idea. It was like, oh, that, what, if, what if we had that by now? What if we had that? That would be so cool. You know, I mean, we do have it. It does exist in the world. It does, bullet trains exist, you know, things like that. Um, uh, uh, I'd love to have Helen's bike. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it was. It's the positivity of the future. It's the hopefulness of the future. It's the imagine if we could build that kind of infrastructure that would allow those good things, and that we could have those kind of nice things to get around. And 
and, uh, and, and make more use of our time to rest or grow or you know, talk, you know, or eat. <laughs> well, hopefully not for destruction and not stuck in traffic. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's kind of what the idea of it was, was the, 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 the cool future. Not the, not the practical future. I think uh, I said that in my quote, a lot of the artwork, well, you know, it happened with uh, NASA in America too. Uh, it happened in the world in general in the early 70s when, if you look in the 60s for the NASA paintings of Mars travel and space travel, it's like, cool. That's what it's going to be like. And in the early 70s, with budget cuts to different agencies and government, it, ne it wasn't about what might be. It became about what we know we can do. And so uh, it, it, and it became boring, <laughs> you know? Um, one of my coworkers thought when they were doing the space shuttle, you know, it's like one of the coolest things, they should have done this, by the way, they should have done this, is they should have given them capes. <laughs> and they should walk out, you know, with cape, and have a fan off the camera blowing the cape. And you know, the second they get on and shut the door, they take it off and put it away. It's fine. But it's just to see them go on, that would have been the greatest thing and simple, you know. Um, that, that's the kind of thing I think uh, people want to feel and see and, and, and uh, a certain promise of the future, you know. So, yeah. I, I say that in my talk uh, about production design, too, is I see a lot of films they paint what exactly what they're gonna make. And that's, I, I understand why, budgets and schedules, I get it, I get it. But imagine if they could spend a little more time kind of imagining something bigger and better than that, uh, to find the best thing for that idea, you know? Uh, that, that's the same kind of thing. I, I think that, that that part is important. Design matters that way, so. One of my first efforts on Finding Nemo was to try and generalize the entire film into a graphic form. I wasn't sure what this was going to bring to the table. I really didn't. I just thought I needed to do it for some reason. I, I wanted to figure out how to discover what we were going to need for production. So uh, I did it in a very simplified graphic form and it was to help break down how to think about what we were going to need. So uh, for lack of a better term, I called it a sheet script, which was again, a very, very pared down graphic of the entire film. Uh, the film's about an overly protective father who has to traverse the ocean to find his lost son. The further he got away from home, the less protection he had. I propose using the plate coral here at the top as a way to hold the father down. He's holding his son down, so it kind of kept him down. It's very protective. And as they go out to the coral reef, of course it opens up a bit, and then we have the drop off, and then when we see the father rise to the surface of the water, the water is actually very high in the frame. And then we rise, and then he actually sinks to the bottom of the ocean and then proceeds with Dory across the ocean as we see the, the ground slope down. They actually go to the very, very depths of the ocean where they see the anglerfish, it's pitch black. And then they end up in the middle of the ocean. Uh, um, let's see, as the ocean floor slipped away till they're, they're fully exposed and lost in the full open ocean. Uh, see here. So this is actually, uh, my, my, I actually went through the film and found the final film frames of that graphic representation. Um, and, and then this is the remainder of the film. This is inside the whale, getting kicked up by the whale. Uh, the next time they rise above the water, the water level is much lower in the frame. And then when Dory, father says goodbye to Dory, again, it's sloping back to screen left. And here we are back at the reef at the end of the film. It's very open. And then this was a little doodle I had done showing father and Nemo hugging at the end of the movie. And then uh, this is the last shot in the film as you see Nemo on the back of Mr. Ray literally disappearing into the water, you know, into the depths of the water. So, and this is the representation of that. The biggest, I took that idea though, and, but I, one of the things I'm still getting used to is the, uh, the ability to, for the computer to really work in a z-axis. I come from hand-drawn animation. I'm a big believer in the clarity of a two-dimensional frame. We work in the third dimension, but the film is still viewed in 2D, even if it's stereo, right? So the, the clarity of a two-dimensional image still holds great sway with me. 
So I kind of hit on this idea and I pitched it to the director and it was kind of exactly what he was thinking as he was uh, imagining some of the film. Um, what that was, was the water density. This is, these are frame graphs of traversing the whole film as well. And the idea would be that at the beginning of the film, you know, Nima's father was the main character. Uh, he was afraid of the present and future because of something that happened in the past. When his only disabled child is stolen from him, he traverses the ocean to find him. Great idea for a family film, right? You know, that's, that's a little odd. Uh, the closer they got to his son in Sydney, Australia, the less he could see. And, uh, and the more he had to trust his instincts. And that's, of course, represented by Dory, who can't remember anything. You know, this meant to me visually that the ocean water should start clear and become progressively more dense. We could also shift the color, you know. Also, it gave me visually somewhere to go. I mean, imagine the entire film being the same blue. Uh, it would have been really difficult. Uh, desaturating the color towards the end of the film in Act 3 provided a strong contrast of the epilogue at the back of the reef at the end, which now seemed brighter and more clear than ever. Actually, technically it was. We, we did make it like probably 30% more clear than the very, very beginning of the film, but it's hard to tell, so it's fine. But that was the idea, was the closer he could get to his son, the less he could see, the more he had to trust the sensing. That's, again, another example that I, I, I attempted to underscore the film in a subtle way that felt very natural to the world of being underwater, but helped unify all of these other disparate ideas. I thought, I thought it was uh, uh, um, pretty successful in, in most of the film. What is your personal definition of animation? Um, I, I don't know how to answer that exactly, but um, I do know what my personal definition of a good movie is, of a good film. So I, I'm just emotionally captivated, you know? Um, I, I, I have changed over time, like hopefully everybody, in that there, there are certain films that I loved as a kid because oh, they look really, really cool. Now as an adult, I. I'm like, uh, I still think it looks really cool, but I'm just not as interested in it. I can watch it once, but I can't watch it 10 times the way I can when I'm emotionally invested in characters and their story and their journey through the story. Um, so it could be live action or animation. I don't care as long as I'm really caught up in the story. So, yeah. so I, I, I love all kinds of films. So. We can see a lot of movies that add too many elements on the screen. What could be the reason for such an error? I don't know. I, I don't know. I think it's a lot of things. It, can be, it could be the director. It could be production. It could be they ran out of money. I don't know. Um, I do know. One I know is that has happened. Is that a film production designer in a live action film that maybe has a lot of computer effects work in it. Um, but the live action film production designer often, when the film is shot, when it's finished, they're off of the film. Now there's another year of visual effects work that has to be done. And if it matters to the director, they keep the production designer on to make sure that visually they're kind of following the plan that was established. Very often that does not happen. Very often uh, another person, a visual effects producer will come on and if you're lucky, you get someone who really respects the design intent of the film, but sometimes, not always, but sometimes you get product, uh, 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 they want to, they're trying to do the right thing by helping and making it better, but they're not following this, the ideas, the visual ideas. And so they start doing all kinds of different things and it starts looking like that. So I, I, I'm, I'm only imagining that that's what's going on. I've seen it happen, but uh, I don't know. Every film is so different, you know. Um, it, it's 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 very hard to do. Yeah. yeah. There's a quote from filmmaker John Waters I always loved. He said, "There's a big difference between bad taste and no taste. Bad taste always being better because somebody thought about it. Um, a lot of these films that I think you're talking about are no taste. They're just kind of whatever." You know, oh, I've got a cool shot, I'll make it really cool. And they're, they are, they're making that shot really cool. But what does it have to do with this shot, and this shot, and this shot, and this character, and the, the bigger picture design? It often doesn't have much to do with it, so it becomes that, so. 
So Wally, Wally was the next film I, I got to watch. And again, I was struggling to find a lot on that film. It was very difficult. Um, one thing that happened with the production of Wally was that Wally Act One actually came out fully, fully formed. It was pretty much the first pass of boards is pretty much what's in the film. That rarely, rarely happens. I've never worked on a film before since that that's happened. So. Um, I used to just dive in doing drawings, and I still can do that sometimes. It's uh, it's fun, you know. But with this, I actually started just putting up words. I would get uh, my cards out and just write little uh, an thesaurus, and sit down and imagine each character. Uh, this is a slightly cleaned up version. It would be a lot messier for a while. And I would just describe the character with words. And uh, there's Eve, and then there's the Earth, and then there's the Axiom by and large. It's a quick, efficient way to get my head around the character and contrasts, and, and of course the research that we're gonna to need to do. And just ideas, just ideas before I start drawing, you know? What I knew launching into Wally, that was the main character, was a bucket of bolts. You know, he lived in a world overrun by trash. His job was to clean up that trash one 14.5 inch cube at a time. Yes, they, that's exactly their size. Uh, my biggest concern was how to make this visually interesting. Again, another, uh, another case of, uh, uh, it's not a man in a robot outfit, it's a robot. Andrew was very, the director was very specific about that. It is not a man in a robot. It is a robot whose job was designed to be specifically to crunch trash. That's it. Um, but over time, over the hundreds of years, he had developed a soul. The world itself was not really changing. It was a monochrome mess of trash everywhere. How are we going to make that interesting? Well, Wally was a romantic. And so it seemed fairly obvious that we should approach it from a romantic point of view. Romantic meaning not lovey-dovey, but romantic in the classical sense of the word that is heightened emotions. And so what we did is we modulated the lighting through the film to support that. And, and so uh, that, that was the conceit that we came up with. Um, so these are the color scripts that I did for Act One. Uh, had, had, again, it was fully formed at the beginning, so I pretty much knew what the action was and what the sets were. What we had to figure out was the lighting. So um, let's step through this. So you can see it's a pretty monochrome world. Uh, we've got the leftovers of the Axiom and by and large down at the bottom right. That was kind of some of the only bright color at the beginning of the film. And he gets back to his little pad there and uh, watches uh, Hello Dolly, <laughs> you know, sorry. Uh, uh, all the way, and it goes back to work. And of course, the first time in the entire film we see the color green is when he finds the little plant there. And then Eve arrives, and we start introducing a little bit later here, at the bottom right, actually in the next strip, we start introducing very, very subtly other colors and pastel colors and a little bit more. You know, he's starting to get close to Eve, and he finally, even at the bottom right, you kind of see it's a much, much more different palette than we were seeing in the previous slides. And uh, then we get a little bit of saturation when they explode, the, when she blows up the ships and everything, it's great. Uh, it finally takes her back to his pad where he turns on all the electricity and of course, much more color in his pad than was there before. And the very last thing he does with her is of course present her the plant he found which causes her to shut down entirely. And we go back to the same palette as Act One, but it's very high key and low contrast. And we recapitulate it in a montage sequence, which basically repeats their relationship up until then. And we finally get to the very, very, uh, let's see if I can use this. This, this scene, which is the last scene of them together. And then we cut back to this one here, the next day where he's going back to work. And this is exactly the same palette and tone as at the very, very beginning of the film. He's kind of giving up and he's got to go back to work. Of course, uh, Eve gets picked up to go back to the Axiom and while he kind of tracks her into space, so. Do you think that the new short series, Spark Shorts, can expand the horizon into new kinds of animation? Yeah, we, 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 I mean, we've always made short films. We've always kind of done that. I think uh, the, 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 this new program, which, uh, it, it's more of a set up. That's the, really the big difference is uh, like for the birds took two years to make and I used resources in between movies whenever someone was available. If I had had the Sparks program, I think for the birds could have been made in, in a very short time, you know, maybe three or four months maybe. 
You know, it's a simple film, you know, really. Um, but it took two years because of that. The Spark Short, the really big advantage for, for the artist and for the studio. Is, and, and also, the other thing is because it took so long, it cost a little more money. So the Spark Short, in being shorter and also more dedicated, you know, they dedicate certain people to it, but, but you know, they get to work, that's what they work on. Um, they, they cost less and they're a little more efficient in terms of timing and getting things done more quickly. So uh, I think it's really cool. They are gonna be doing some different looks and some different testing and different kind of experimentation. The shorts have never made money. They're there for testing and for book, sometimes for, for, bleh, for, for publicity, you know, they, they, we, we, and we love doing them, you know, it's fun to do. What is your point of view regarding the photorealistic style in animation? For example, like The Lion King. I, I don't know what to think about that, really. I think what I, what I think is, um, when I, someone asked a question about what I thought of the word animation, or when I think of animation, I think, I think when I think of animation, I think of ballet, I think of caricature, I think of, not, not cartoony, yeah. I don't mean cartoony, it can be realistic uh, looking, but caricature, uh, uh, distilled to the essence of a character or a meaning or a look or a movement. Um, when I see a lot of live action looking CG films where the care, it's kind of like, uh, uh, do you know a rotoscope when they trace yeah. live action? Yeah. When, when they only trace live action, it kind of looks like, like we're just moving around talking. Not, when I think of film like Cinderella, they, which they also rotoscope, but they rotoscoped key frames. They would, it was like ballet. It was not about realistic movement, it was about stylized movement. And even when they shot the, shot the live action, they, they stylized the movement when the form a little further out, the neck was a little thinner, and the looks were more direct. And so, yeah, I, I think that, uh, like a film like The Jungle Book, the, the Favreau, John Favreau Jungle Book, I love the Disney animation. There's what, five other versions of the film, too, um, through history the quarter version from the 40s and silent version. But when I, I love the Disney animation film, I grew up with that, but, but I thought Favreau's version was fantastic. I just loved it. And it had a certain realistic quality to the look, but the acting and the posing was very caricature. And that's what I appreciated about, it. oh, they're not just moving animals around. They're actually giving them and imbuing them with character. And I thought that was great. So uh, where I don't know where it's going to go. I don't know. I I, uh, I I I feel personally that there's a room for a, a whole lot of hybrid, different styles. I I, I, I think it's exciting. That's what I, that ended on my slide in my talk. It's like again, now that technology's caught up with what we can do. Because when I started Toy Story, we we couldn't do rack focus. We couldn't. We I couldn't change the focus in a scene. We had no atmosphere. That's why the background's just as bright as the foreground. That we couldn't do that kind of stuff. Um, it was really hard, <laughs> you know. Now we can do anything. Yeah. Now, now what? Now tell me a story that makes me want to care. You know, make me care. <laughs> you got to. Not only do you have to make an audience care, you got to make a crew care because they're going to spend a long time on this. So yeah. What movie was the most challenging to make? It, it was Inside Out. Inside Out was, uh, I love the film. I'm glad it was successful and did really well. It was just incredibly hard to, it, it, like I said in my talk, if there was a change in the mind world, something changed in the real world. If there was a change in the real world, it had something changed in the mind world. What does the mind look like? It's not the brain, it's the mind, you know? And uh, yeah, there was a lot. It was a very, very challenging. Um, and, I still don't know how to think about that film. I can think about the specifics like I did when I worked on the movie. Oh, then this needs to be this, or this needs to be this, or this needs to be this. But zooming out to see the big picture, I don't know if I was ever able to do, you know. I don't know if it made the film better or worse. It made the film be what it needed to be. But just from a, a, an intellectual point of view, for me, I don't know how to think about that film yet, you know. It took me about five years to watch Wally and understand what we had done. So, but but even when I finished the film, I knew that I had put together some visual conceits that were helping the film. You know, so yeah. 
it's hard. It's really hard. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Inside Out. Uh, Inside Out is really difficult. I spent five and a half years on this film, and it was a film where most of what I thought I knew about designing a film often eluded me. Uh, directed by Pete Docter and, and Ronnie Del Carmen, uh, had a lot of challenges which were fun, frustrating, exhilarating, maddening. Um, one thing I knew going in is again the contrast of the real world to the mind world. And this is a board my uh, texture art director Burke Berry put together for this. So with the mind world textures, we thought it would be really great uh, thinking of the mind, not the brain, but we kind of mixed them up a bit. It was electrochemical. And so that word suggests electricity and color and liquid and all kinds of translucency, transblurrency, a word we made up, um, and uh, uh, abs absorbing light and transmitting light. And that became the base, and saturation, that became the basis of the entire world, uh, both for the characters and the memories and everything in the world of the mind, versus the real world textures, which were hard surface muted colors, uh, hyper textural and visually complex, and high key and low contrast. Um, the reason that was because, again, like on the axiom, as any, we more so than the axiom, throughout the entire film, we were cutting that from the real world to the mind world back and forth. So I needed the audience not to have to think about it. They had to know right away, oh, I'm in the mind world, oh, I'm in the real world, I'm in the mind world, I'm in the real world. Uh, and that, that, that unto itself was a challenge. Um, designing the real world was actually pretty straightforward for us. And this is a real world component of some of this, and then we cut to the mind world. So you can see the contrast of the color and the and, 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 uh, values. The only thing that we were able to do, of course, was towards the end of the film, unify the worlds by uh, desaturating it as, as, as Riley became depressed and kind of unifying the worlds until they came back together at the very, very end of the film. What this was about, seriously, was one of the most difficult choices we had to make in the film was what would be the sky color in the mind. I had done a whole series of these early, early paintings, um, and I couldn't figure out what we wanted. Pete Docker had this idea that, depending on Riley's mood, the sky would change to that color, so if she was angry, it might be red, if she was sad, it might be blue. We were afraid it would look like Malibu light spinning in her head. Um, so we had very little time left, and I dragged the, the producer, Jones Rivera, Pete, into the art room, and I said, you know what? I did all these little paintings. They weren't about the sky at all. They were about a lot of other things, but one thing that's in common is old sky colors are in a very tight range, very neutral. And I, uh, he said, well, they asked me why. I said, I don't know. It was intuition. Ultimately, what I discovered is we have so much color on the ground with the characters and the memories that I needed something neutral for that to read against and look pleasant so that it didn't just become a cacophony of color and, and light, you know? So, so I said, I think this is the sky color. And they said, I think you're right. So we had a glass of champagne, I don't know. You know? <laughs> it's uh, crazy. You have tried a lot of diverse roles in your life. What is your favorite one and what other roles do you want to try? I, I, really, like, I really like production design. I like it a lot. I get to, I make the director's job easier. Their job is so hard. I don't, I don't think I would be, I, I, I don't want the responsibility of a director. Their job is too hard. I like kind of flying under the radar next to them. That's why I love working with Brad and Pete and Andrew and, and other directors where I'm, I, I get, I have a front row seat to everything that needs to happen and I get to make it happen. But I don't have that responsibility of, of, that they do. The weight is on their shoulders. But I, I do take it seriously that my job isn't just making pictures and making a movie, but it's to make their job easier. Tell me what you want, I'll put it on the screen. I know how to do that. So, yeah. What do I want to do? I'd like to try doing some live action stuff, maybe. You know, we'll see. What does the mind look like? We did a lot of research, determined that and we did a lot of research and while we were determined to focus on designing the mind and not the brain, we found a lot of practical use of studying how the brain was created and used much of what we learned to great effect. Um, things like where the shelves or memories are stored in the mind, the reason we folded them over is because by the way your brain works, it says it's folded, it allows the neurons to talk to each other in a much more close proximity 
versus had it been stretched out, it would have to traverse a, a lot, um, travel a lot further to provide information back and forth. But this is an idea that gave us a conceit for how to design the shelves of memories in the mind. Um, let's see. These are, there's a board we call rainbow board. So they, they, they inject chemicals into brains and then photograph them. So it kind of creates these cool images. Very inspiring. Getting our heads around the geography of the mind world was challenging. Uh, many maps plotting out what it might be and needed to tell the story we created. Here are only a handful, believe me, this is like one third of what we did. I'll just step through these kind of quickly. What is the mind? What does it look like? Where are we? You know, uh, how does it work? What regions are there? Okay, we have geometry, logic, music. I mean, they could be anything. And uh, while that sounds exciting, and it is, um, you need to start editing and limiting and what you need to tell the story. And how do you suggest a bigger world there is that, that you actually need to build or can build? So. and we start honing in on it. As you can imagine, solidifying what this all meant was incredibly difficult. I worked with a terrific art department that generated more artwork on any film that I worked on at Pixar, probably the most of any film at Pixar. I hear only a few of my early paintings exploring both the real world and the mind world uh, very early on. Um, I needed to do that because count, countless, you know, so many ideas, but it it also represents a moment of the ever, each one of these paintings represents a moment of the ever ch changing aspect of the storytelling that needed to take place. So you can imagine by, by feeling the need to intuit myself through the process, I got lost in the process. But I feel, truly do feel, it was the only way to get this film done. Um, but it did prevent me from zooming out again uh, uh, as much as I needed to, to kind of get, get my head around the bigger conceits of the, the, the visual language of the film. The, the far right image is one of the early concepts that I did just, you know, trying to throw stuff up to the director. That, that at the bottom right, the, that was joy and sadness traveling to uh, the id, which was through a thorn forest. At one point on the upper left, you can see it looks like a little bit of a theater. Riley actually went to visit her grandmother who passed away. It was a hoofer on, on Broadway in the 20s and 30s. The train of thought was a much bigger aspect of the film for a long time. It fell away. It's still, I mean, it's still in the film, but it fell away. Um, the lower right image, that was where Riley lived in Brooklyn. Um, but that's all she remembered was her building. You know, she just imagined it being in a deep forest, that's all she could remember. Uh, but this is, this was uh, a, a lot, it was crazy. It was crazy. I did so many paintings trying to figure out what this film was. Um, that uh, while it was very frustrating and time consuming and uh, all of these crazy things, I, I did get lost in it. What is the work you are most proud of? Uh, all of them. <laughs> They're all so different. That's like trying to say which, who's your favorite kid, you know? That's, I like them all for different reasons, you know? Obviously, to me, Toy Story is a special place. It's in its own thing, you know? I always love, I had a teacher, uh, Tihi, it was his name, Thornton He, and uh, he once told me, you know, he was, old, he was very old when he was my teacher, but he directed uh, a lot of Fantasia and Pinocchio. He said, Pinocchio was probably Walt Disney's best film, but his greatest achievement was Snow White. And he's right. And so I think of Toy Story as being that special thing, you know, it, have we made better looking films? Yes. <laughs> but story-wise, that film holds up still exceptionally well. I just saw it recently with a, a bunch of uh, actors at the Screen Actors Guild. They had a benefit, and uh, Bob Pauly, character designer on the film, and I went down and gave a talk, and 
We decided, we'd sit there. We had not seen the film on the big screen in 20 years. I just hadn't, you know? Not from beginning to end, anyway. And we sat and watched it, and we were like, oh, God, that looks horrible. But we were caught up in this story, too, you know? So, yeah, you know. Yeah. Cool. All right. Great. Thank you. Oh, no, thank you. I appreciate it. I hope I answered your questions. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. That is my quote from my friend. <laughs> Jason Deemer. I use this in every talk. It's pain is temporary, suck is forever. <laughs> Digging a little deeper matters in the long run. If you need to make a change and it's going to make something better, not just different, but better, more clear, more understandable to an audience, it's worth it. Because it's going to be there for a long time. So pain is temporary, suck is forever. Quote by Jason Deemer. So. Uh, sorry for going over, but I really felt that I needed to get that out of my system, so thank you very much.